You're listening to another episode of Zealous Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Snyder. This week, I've got Danielle Honnett in the house. She is with the Minnesota Twins Organization, a physical therapist who's primarily working in Florida spring training as well as with the minor league teams. So we're going to talk all about her role with the Twins Organization, how she got to be there, and all the things that she does throughout her days working with the athletes. Be sure to hit subscribe, follow us on Instagram at Rocky underscore Snyder, and away we go. Here we go. It's it's another episode of Zealous Podcast, and it seems like baseball is on the trend right now. Of course, it's the off season, so that makes sense. I've got a lot of colleagues, friends around the country here that have time on their hands, and I'm meeting a new friend here right now, Danielle. Uh, thank you for coming on. I Let's just jump right into it. You are a physical therapist with the Minnesota Twins organization, but how did you get to be there? Where did you go to school? Oh, what was What was your path to where you are now? Yes, I uh, I grew up in southern Minnesota and getting wanting to get away from the cold. I decided to venture south, so I went to Baylor University. Um, initially started as a pre-med major and then quickly realized that wasn't the path that I wanted. I really wanted to pursue athletic training, um, but was un- unable to as I was an athlete at the time. And so exercise physiology was the route that I chose. I'm um, curious, why, why yeah. were you disenfranchised? What was it about uh, pre-med that you just said, "Eh, that's not the route? What was it about it? Yeah, yeah. Um, In high school, I had a knee knee injury. It was just a nagging knee thing that kind of popped up and realized that I had a meniscus tear. So, of course, I had that experience where I met with the surgeon and they had had surgery on my knee. They fixed my knee. I thought it was the best thing ever. Um, Really weird at the time. I actually did not go through a formal bout of physical therapy, which with what I do now, it seems very strange. Um, but I sought out an athletic trainer locally, um, that did worked a lot with the community and with sports performance, um, at a neighboring community. So I kind of started to dabble in understanding that, that part of it. And so I knew, I knew what I see physical therapy as now kind of existed, but I didn't, quite know the direct path to get there so sports med i I still don't get why you just said forget it i want to be up i mean obviously you were yeah you were enthralled by the athletic trainer that you had and and so on but why why did you turn your back on sports men on sport or like yeah or just just pre-med medicine in general um i think it was just going back to that situation of my only interaction with a surgeon was like right before surgery day and the appointment and then um surgery day and that was in like a follow-up here and there but Got it. the process of like seeing the actual process happen and getting better and learning how to um yeah that that part really resonated with me I wanted to be right. more involved in the process right on yeah. that's great okay so you you go to Baylor and uh, mm-hmm. you're an athlete, you want to do athletic training, but you can't because of the time commitment there. So then what? Yeah. So I landed on exercise physiology. Um, I was exposed to chiropractic growing up. So my next thought was to go chiropractic school. So that didn't exist as a major. So I just planned on taking whatever prerequisites I could get. Um, basically kind of pre-med at the time, but also exercise physiology as a major. And I planned on doing anything I could to kind of just gain experience. Um, Yeah, so I did a a sports performance internship at a facility actually in Minnesota. I wanted to spend the summer back in the Twin Cities. So I did a summer internship up there. And then that summer I did a lot of research online to kind of figure out what career paths felt right. And I landed on sports physical therapy. And so I think this was going into my senior year of college. I'm like, well, now I need to change directions again because this feels like a better fit. So started taking a few different prerequisites at that time as well. Well, how, what's the difference between just physical therapy and sports <clears throat> physical therapy? If, if there's in the listening audience, they're like, ah, oh, for myself. Yeah. I just thought, okay, you're, you get your doctor of physical therapy and then you branch out into the different elements or, or, or genres that there are, but you could actually specialize in sports physical therapy. 
You can, but you still have to go through PT school. So you still have to go through the general training of PT school, but I landed on, like they had specialty programs and there were residencies and there were ways that where you can kind of certify to specialize in sports PT. And it, I think that really resonated with me because I couldn't do the athletic training at the time. Um, and I, I knew I always wanted to work with athletes. I resonated with the mindset of an athlete. Um, and I just wanted to stay around sports as, as much as I could. So that was kind of the route that I, I planned on. That's very cool. So when it came yeah. to the athletes at Baylor and your concentrated studies there, what mm -hmm. it, or you actually, you went back to Minnesota and got your DPT. So were yeah. you working a, with athletes at Baylor while you were doing your exercise phys or did that come later when you moved back up to Minnesota? Yeah, that really came later. Um, I finished my schooling at Baylor and I moved back to Minnesota. I still needed some prerequisites. So I moved up to the Twin Cities at the time. I, uh, I started doing personal training. I started doing sport performance training and any and all odd jobs as I was going to a community college up there to get the last, I think I had three or four more classes to get um, before I could actually apply to PT schools. So I had about a two year gap between undergrad and grad school um, starting. Got it, got it. Okay, and then once you enrolled in the physical therapy uh, program, uh, you started to do specialized classes there working with athletes as well? So yeah, I kept, I kept personal training because I kind of felt that was the best way to take what I was learning in the classroom and kind of apply it from a little bit of the sports performance lens um, but just working with clients. So most of the clients that I was working with at that time were actually gen pop. Um, I had like my younger, my younger gen pop to my older clientele where I could practice some of the balance training that we were learning and some of those different principles. And I also just started looking for other opportunities outside of school to kind of keep learning. Um, so I started, that's actually when I took my first FMS class and kind of got exposed to the FMS philosophy a little bit. Um, and it just kept stirring a lot of questions um, and kind of how, how you can start blending all these fields, right? So it's not just, not just sports medicine or getting people back to feeling healthy, but how can you go past that? How can you get someone um, to never come see you in the first place, I guess, yeah. was kind okay. of starting to be... I'm, I'm, a little bit. Well, I'm curious <clears throat> that that sounds awesome and, and and blending it all together so that there is this continuum and it isn't just yeah. uh, a stop and go here and a stop and go there and so on and, and, and a disconnect but I'm curious because you mentioned phys uh, personal training while mm -hmm. taking physical therapy courses and so on so how did your programs while dealing with gen pop or whomever you were dealing with during phys uh, personal training how did your programs change or how were they um how did you adapt them compared to the conventional approach that you commonly will find oh. in personal training manuals you know what i mean you already mentioned balance training so i, yeah. I got you there but were there other elements i don't so to be honest i think back to when i was doing that i was probably terrible i know i was terrible <laughs> <laughs> it was like i'm just gonna embrace the fact that i was not a good personal trainer at the time but i was getting my feet wet and I was learning a lot of things and being able to apply it. So um, I, I learned a lot from my colleagues. I worked at a couple different gyms in the area. And so I'd see them do something and I'd just ask questions. Hey, can you show me that? Or I started trying to teach different classes or create different classes that still sparked some of that. Like I tried to get a athletic performance class off the ground of a small group fitness class. Um, I taught TRX classes. I actually really liked that once I got the hang of it. Um, so I just really started experimenting and I kind of just, I embraced the fact that this like personal training in and of itself was not where I was going to end up, but I knew it was a really good avenue to kind of continue to honestly try to help people. Um, but I, just because I was going to PT school, I don't think I was a good personal trainer. Like no way. <laughs> gotcha. All right. So 
just fast forward the loop a little bit here. You get out of yeah. PT school, you're, you're a physical therapist. Now what? Now what? Um, well, because I had those two years of, of kind of a gap, I was a little bit older than most of my classmates and I just really wanted to hit the ground running. So I sought out sports residency. Um, there are a lot more sports residencies out there now. At the time, there, there were still quite a few, but it wasn't quite as popular um, as it is now. Uh, I looked at a lot of different places, but I landed on University of Evansville and Pro Rehab Sports Residency um, because they were teaching the FMS system. And going to that first FMS class, it really, like, I really wanted to understand it more. Um, I had met a physical therapist during that first FMS class that I went to that was utilizing the SFMA and I had no idea what that was at the time and he's like well just come in and shadow me and so started shadowing him it was an awesome experience I ended up learning a little bit more about that on a um, so in PT school we have what we call clinicals so I had an eight week clinical where I just so happened to land with someone that also utilized that. So I got to learn a lot of that. So I sought out that residency specifically to try to understand and learn that system a little bit more. Um, and so I went to Evansville, Indiana, and I landed there for about three and a half years. So. Nice. Okay. So <clears throat> side story here. I, I, yeah. I have this colleague who's a physical therapist in the area. He was working in my studio uh, many years ago, and I encouraged him to join me down at one of the Perform Better training summits in Long Beach, California. And he went with me, and I had been going for several years, and this was kind of his first experience with FMS and understanding the chain reaction of the kinematic sequencing and how if I've got restriction here, how it could manifest somewhere deeper down the chain or further down in the form of inflammation or itises and so on. And, and he's somewhat fresh out of physical therapy school where he's spent the last five years. And, and well, we're, we're at the end of the day and we're just at one of the, the local brew pubs sitting and, and uh, chatting with him and a colleague and they start peppering me with all these questions. And, and then they start really getting kind of upset and, and not at me just so much as they're like, how is it that, cause I'm just a personal trainer. I'm just a gym rat. I lift heavy things and count to 10. That's, that's basically my life for the last 30 years. They're like, how is it that you know these things? And we just spent the last five years in physical therapy school and this is all new to us. They, they were really quite upset. I guess I'm bringing this up, not as a way of slamming physical therapy education, mm -hmm. but there, there seems to be and this was 10, 15 years ago, maybe it's changed since then, but there isn't the, the same approach or application that you would find in, in methodologies like FMS and SFMA. I mean, did you find the same with your, your education? Yeah, so I think it was just like a couple moments during that FMS course was a, like a light bulb moment. And I honestly, it was, I had a history of shoulder issues from back, going back to college. And we were practicing arm bars and some of the kettlebell work. And, and they explained um, like the reciprocal engagement of the rotator cuff when you consider compression and distraction. And I think it was just this huge light bulb moment for me of thinking we don't need to be doing isolated ER, IR just for the cuff anymore. Like, and then the fact that I could hardly hold up this light kettlebell. And I think at that moment, it just, got the ball rolling in my head of thinking it's not just orthopedics it's not just neuro rehab it's not just acute care but it's like we don't understand how the nervous system even it like I think that's where like overlays in orthopedics right mm -hmm. and how it's not just a an orthopedic driven biomechanics driven system but that the nervous system can, can drive that and I think those are the components that I saw in FMS and SFMA that they were starting to kind of get me to ask some of those questions of, we can think about this a little bit differently. Um, and so like, I think that's why I was so drawn to wanting to learn more about it because it, it really did blend all of it, um, but it, it kind of hit a gap in the system for me that yeah. I wasn't quite getting when I was in school. 
Awesome. Yeah, there's so much more information out there aside from the the formal institutions. Uh, so much great information. Where where are your eyes going right now these days? Before we get into your work with the Minnesota and how you even landed with the Twins, because yeah, I want to yeah. hear about that. But what what are you interested in learning right now? Is it motor neurology? Is it central nervous system and, and brain science? Um, definitely a little bit. Uh, I think this past year, I really wanted to understand that more. Kind of the like I can speak in broad terms and understand it from a behavioral sense, but I really wanted to understand it a little bit more scientifically so that I could back it a little better. Um, and honestly, I think it's just learning how different systems overlay. Um, like FMS is not the end all be all, but how does that overlay with PRI? How does it overlay with DNS? And how do so many of these systems actually like blend and layer into one another more than that. So I think that's been a big, um, a big draw for me to try to learn. Um, I could go into any other <laughs> rabbit hole. Um, sure. Yeah, Very I think cool. there's a few other techniques that I've wanted to learn, but that's kind of the, the heart of it. Yeah, dry needling, are you going there? Yeah, I've been there. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> figured as much. So yeah, very yeah. cool. Uh, Okay, so how, how did you get with the twins? So do you have other organizations and eventually land in your own home state, yeah. uh, so to speak? Yeah, crazy, um, crazy how it actually came about. I grew up a twins fan, love the twins. Uh, when I went to college, I think I watched a lot of baseball just to kind of keep my roots to Minnesota. Um, Minnesota probably baseball and football a lot. Uh, going into PT school, our very first class, we had a class on the shoulder. And we learned about UCL injuries. I did a paper on a UCL injury. Like, like this is awesome. And um, just I've kind of ever since starting PT school, baseball has kind of been the route that I wanted to go. Um, went to sports residency in the effort to kind of get that SCS to kind of get my foot in the door of an organization. And it just ended up being a little harder than I thought. Uh, so I started to let that dream kind of go. And lo and behold, it was actually a connection from Baylor uh, that brought me back to kind of the Twins organization. I was working in a clinic in North Central Florida in Ocala and stay connected with a colleague of mine um, that was the wife of a, a coach from college and kind of networked with her. She was working with the Twins at the time and about a year and a half later, uh, things kind of opened up and uh, the organization actually reached out to me for an opening. And so I was about what, five and a half years out of, out of PT school at the time, had completely given up on a job in baseball and it just happened to land in my lap. So um, it's a little bit of a roundabout way to get here, but. And you've been with the twins how long now? I'm um, going into my third season. So I've been with them two years. Excellent. And so you are, you're based out of Florida and you're dealing with mainly all the minor league players, the DR players and so on that are on the IR or, or uh, somewhere on that spectrum. Is that right? Yep. Yep. That's right. Okay. And, and I imagine just loving every minute of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think the biggest thing in just being different from the clinic, like the nine to five grind of being in a clinic is like patient after patient whereas the environment within baseball just being a part of a team um and kind of getting to see these guys day in day out um normally I'm I'm seeing the guys that have to go through the injury process and usually the longer term injuries at that and so it's a little bit of a grind but just seeing it's such a reward to get them back onto the field and playing and um Honestly, it just comes back to it's so much more rewarding being a part of a team than going back to doing the nine to five in a clinic. We're just going to take a quick little intermission here from our conversation with Danielle, because I want to tell you about a couple of workshops that I will be teaching next month, January 2023 on the East Coast. 
On the 21st of January, I will be at the Perform Better Functional Training Institute teaching a course all about closed chain biomechanics of the lower body. Understanding what the joints have to do when movement occurs will give you better insight on how the soft tissue responds. Game-changing information that will make you look at your rehab or fitness programs in a whole new different light. Now, the next two days, January 22nd and 23rd, I'll be in Hingham, Massachusetts, focusing on the upper body. What happens with upper body mechanics in a closed chain environment? So we're talking all about gait mechanics and understanding what the whole body has to do. Put those three days together and there's going to be a tremendous amount of information that you can use for your craft. Now, if you go to my website, rockysnyder.com, click events, drop down to workshops and courses, sign up there. In fact, that one day perform better, there's 40 percent off right now if you register in the next week or so so be sure to check those out and let's get back to the conversation got it okay so, so without without naming player names or anything like that let's just take somebody that you've been working with and uh, can you just take me through the process like what is the injury that you're dealing with uh, what kind of rehabilitative uh, pros- procedures are you are you going with what are you looking for and so on Yeah. Um, so I might answer this a little bit more broadly, but I mean, we get players that land with us for a variety of reasons. I mean, we have our fair share of UCL injuries. We have our fair share of shoulder injuries, but then you have lower extremity injuries. You have hand fractures, you have finger fractures from getting hit with baseball or hit, um, hands on the bat. Um, wrist injuries. So you get any and all of those. And then it's also a a triage of figuring out, okay, how, how quick can we get them back? Or how much time does it take in the sense of, do we have time to help them develop as a player? Um, It's, it's really a much more complicated kind of decision process because you have to have the whole team as a part of that. And I think that's the part that I thrive with and I really enjoy. Um, and yeah, so it it, it's really takes a little bit of like all of it. Right. So I'm using some of my, my normal PT school skills. I'm using needles, I'm using, um, manual therapy, but I'm also using motor learning and different exercise drills to kind of get them going. But then it's also just pure sport development at the time too and kind of using that time as a time to lay a better foundation um, well, while they what other positions downtime. what other coaches yeah. or, or professionals are that make up your team obviously there'll be an athletic yeah. trainer there's a strength coach but uh what are, what are the roles are that come to the team yes yeah, so we we function under the whole sport de- uh sorry sport performance department which encompasses um athletic trainers, physical therapists, strength and conditioning professionals, nutrition, sports psychologists. Um, But then you have the extension of the coaching staff, right? So you have coordinators at each and every level coaching, um, pitching coaches, hitting coaches. um, And then you have your front office as well, kind of helping make those decisions. Um, Within our direct rehab team, we have PTs, we have... um, an SNC coach that works exclusively with rehab. And then we have a rehab pitching coach and a rehab hitting coach. And that kind of makes up the core of our, our rehab team under the sport performance umbrella. Is there a passing of a baton? You know what I mean? Like in track and field, like when, when you get to a certain point with an athlete, do you just pass it over to the strength coach or, or um, AT and then the AT takes it to the strength coach or whatever the, there is that uh, kind of path or, do you, are you constantly involved with every player uh, it, throughout the entire thing, even though they may, may not be presenting with any symptoms of any sort? Um, so if they're, if they're a rehab athlete, they land with us, the, the PTs. If they're a healthy athlete, they're in the AT's hands at whatever affiliate that they're at. Um, so there's a little bit of a passing of the baton if, if the player has to come to Fort Myers. But as far as that rehab process of acute injury to back on the field, it just becomes kind of a a continuum of who's more involved at the time, but all of us are involved throughout the whole process. So we want to keep the player as involved in baseball activities as we can just to keep their um, 
spirits up. We want to get them in the weight room, keep their conditioning, aerobic capacity, strength up whenever we can. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say we strive to kind of make it as cohesive of a process as possible. Got it. Okay. So when it comes to some of the most common occurrences in regards to say injuries, what, what are the top, give me like the top three or four that yeah. is, is happening right now. Yeah. So across baseball, the top three or four would be um, like hamstring strains uh, shoulder injuries, uh, UCL injuries are up there. Even back and oblique injuries are up there as well. Um, those are kind of the top, that's four to five. Um, hamstring injuries don't normally make it down to see us in Florida. They're usually managed because they're a shorter term injury that most of the time the ATs can manage at their affiliates. So we actually see a lot of shoulder, a lot of elbow just because of the downtime from throwing and then the amount of time that it would take to get them back. So that becomes a longer term process to get them back on the field. And do you do like a joint by joint assessment of a person, whether, you know, we're talking rotary athletes primarily. So there's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of, of uh, deceleration, acceleration through, through this vertical um, rotation or axis rotation. So do, are you looking at uh, how well do, do both knees rotate, the hips, the the lumbar, T-spine, all the way through to see if there's restriction and that's why the, the shoulder is getting beat up and so on. I mean, what's your approach with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, it kind of still comes down to how long this athlete has with, while they're with us and how in depth we can go. If it's like, if it's a, they go for Tommy John surgery, get their UCL repaired or reconstructed, then we have a longer runway. So I'm very detailed um, in that process. Uh, if it's a shorter term injury, it's trying to find the biggest bang for your buck and also make sure that injured part is, is where it needs to be to get them back to playing healthy. Um, so I, I default to like an SFMA assessment in addition to like local orthopedic assessments. Got it. So, okay, we'll take the UCL uh, as an example. Do you find that there are certain profiles, body types, if you will, that you just commonly see with, with such an injury or, or for any of those injuries for that matter. Like when it comes to high hamstring pull, I can see them having a pelvic position that is either too anteriorly tilted or posteriorly tilted, but definitely not in a more neutral place. So that that proximal hamstring, that that origin is either in a compressed or under a tremendous amount of tension based on pelvic position, right? So anybody that has too much tilt, they may be predisposed to something like that. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So when it comes to like yeah. UCL or rotator UCL. cuff, I mean, granted, we're throwing balls at, yeah. and hurtling them at 100 miles an hour. So there's going to be some breakdown but are there body types? So I don't know if there's body types because I've seen a lot of different body types have that injury, right? And I think it comes back to saying that when they have a UCL surgery, it's kind of, it's the end of the whip. And so it's really coming back to your like head to toe assessment, what's going wrong in the chain and figuring out Kind of what's contributing to that and I think with different body types you tend to find certain things tend to be a, a contributor a little bit more so than others um so you're able to pick up on those patterns but I don't think it's ever the same thing in each player sure sure I, that would be something if it was but yeah. wondering if there were definitely trends um so exclusively with the baseball players there's there's no other sports that that you've been dealing with right you're just you're primarily with the twins organization yeah so the last two years i've been prim just with the twins organization only with baseball um, okay then what about positional then within baseball mm -hmm. like you've got outfielders you've got the pitch uh, pitchers and you've got catchers uh three types of athletes they mm -hmm. just exclusively like and with different physical demands so when you're when you're working with the pitchers do you find that you're going to have certain certain common 
uh, symptoms that appear compared to the catchers, compared to the outfielders and so on? Um, I think it's frequency is definitely a thing, right? So yeah. like pitchers, just exposure risk. They're throwing the ball way more in general and at higher intensity. So we tend to see a lot of pitchers. I think they probably make up about two thirds of our, our rehab roster usually. Um, catchers, outfielders, they usually push through a lot more. So when we do see them, they tend to be more of the fractures or the other types of injuries that we tend to see. Um, from a body type perspective, whew, um, I think your pitchers tend to be more, more bendy and flexible a little bit, but that's, there are definitely exceptions to that. Um, so. Sure. And, and catchers, I, I imagine there's a good deal of compression just staying in that squat position for prolonged periods of time. And yeah. then outfielders, you're, you're dealing with sprint mechanics primarily. So multi-directional, I can see there being more hamstring issues with the outfielders and, and infielders for that matter, compared mm -hmm. to say pitchers and catchers. Interesting. So when it's, when it's time to, to meet an athlete for the first time, what are some of the things that you're, you're doing, like screening process, interviewing, and so on? What, how do, you, how do yeah. you approach that? Kind of all of it. So when a player comes down to see us, um, we're usually still in like gathering mode. Um, they may or may not see, need to see a physician yet. So we're kind of planning all those appointments. Um, but once they land in Florida, they usually come in and we start with just a conversation and plan a good time to set aside time to go through a good eval. Um, and so that might be at the beginning of the day, that might be towards the end of the day, but we're trying to involve them in what other activities we can just to kind of get the body moving and get them going. Um, but when it is time to kind of sit down, it's usually gathering a good history, just like you would in the clinic and doing kind of a greater screen definitely doing a local assessment of whatever injured part they have and kind of starting to put a lot of those pieces together and seeing like priorities, priorities as to like what we really need to work on. And how much of your role is manual? Is it like 80% or is it 50-50? Um, I mean, I would say hopefully less. Like my goal is not to actually need to use manual very often. But my goal is also to be very good at good at it when I need to. Um, if I can get them to do things via exercise, awesome. Depending on where they're at in their progression, um, I also don't want them to have to rely on me. It's going to be a lot of education and getting them to be as independent as possible because they're not going to be with me hopefully ever again. <laughs> and then they have to rely on the athletic trainers. And as they're moving up through the minor league system. They get different trainers each and every year, sometimes throughout the year if they're moving up and down. So it's really getting them to be as independent as possible to carry for themselves. Um, uh, right on. Okay, how about this? This is kind of out of the out of left field, so to speak. But you know, there's there are these long drive champions in golf, and they're they're not on the PGA tour. They're all about just explosive rotational power. How far can I hit that freaking ball? Right to how yeah. many hundreds of yards? And many of them some not too many years ago were from Canada and and it when they looked at these players or these athletes they found that in the off season they were playing hockey but they were playing hockey in a left-handed fashion if they were right-handed golfers and vice versa so there is this thought that all this rotational power mm -hmm. that is unilateral it is this one dimensional one directional shall i say force producing always to the right or always to the left and to counteract that really helped the, their athletic ability and potentially a reduction of, of injury. So long-winded there, but with your players, do you encourage, say, a right-handed thrower to do a lot of left-handed activity just to offset all this rotational force that they have for years been created? It depends on the injury, but yes, like if they're a right-handed thrower, I'm usually having them use, you've got Indian clubs in the background. I'm usually having them do Indian clubs, both sides, or most of our UCL guys that can't throw, 
with say their right hand, they're usually really wanting to throw with their left hand. So I encourage it as long as we're being safe. Um, I think like sprinting forwards, backpedaling, like yin and yang, there's always that balance. So whenever we can get it, I would definitely shoot for it. Um, as far as like, like swinging or hitting, like swinging opposite, I'm, I'm in for it, but I just, we also want to account for like total workload. So usually we find other means, whether it's medicine balls or um, other athletic based activities that we can balance that and really use that other side. Nice. Oh, you had me at Indian clubs. That's all you had to yeah. say. That's great. <laughs> So I, I don't often see any kind of uh, practice or conditioning involved in the Indian club. So it's great that they're down there. I, what other tools do you like? What other, what other kind of elements or instruments that are, are kind of in your toolbox? Um, I honestly, I'm pretty minimalist. I, uh, I like to kind of see what you can use with my hands, with the floor, like getting an athlete onto the floor and like closed chain movements. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, like medicine balls when it's appropriate, like just athletic, good athletic movement and trying to teach an athlete to be an athlete again. Um, I, I value a lot of those things. Um, I'll use bands here and there. I'll use kettlebells a lot. Um, what else? Yeah. That's pretty Probably good. A little bit more minimalist than... And of course, you're you're in a sport that is extremely multicultural, and you've got mm -hmm. a lot of Dominican players and so on. So how how does that work with you? Do you speak a number of languages, or or how do you get around the 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 cultural differences? Yeah, rely on my teammates that do speak Spanish really well um, and help us communicate better. But really, it's just learning and being open to to learning. I had the opportunity to go down to the DR uh, a little over a year ago for an opportunity down there. That was a good learning experience. Um, and just, I think just practicing because most of our Dominican players and or Venezuelan players, they are trying to learn English, but it's also an uncomfortable experience when you're not good at something. So when they see you putting forth the effort of learning Spanish, they can appreciate that. And I think it gets both of us to be okay with practicing and getting it wrong. Um, yeah, so plenty of experiences saying the wrong thing for sure, but they're usually pretty forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this? We've been, we've been talking about a whole bunch of different approaches, FMS and DNS and PRI and so on. And within there, there's this scope that you, you, you can do open chain movements, closed chain. We can go from simple single joint motion to complex movements. We can have an isometric hold, or we can go from neutral to concentric or eccentrically load the muscles. Like when do you know which to do? Do you know what? How do you sort yeah. through it? and go, okay, we need to really isolate into here. We need to make sure it's stable. I just need to do an isometric hold here. And then let's integrate all these closed chain actions together. Like what's, what's your yeah. methodology? So I think it just kind of happens. I don't know that I've, I've, I'm working on writing this down so that I can actually say this is like, this is why, but it's kind of coming more intuitively. Um, I, it really comes down to, can they control the local joint like, do I, if they can't, then let's start isometrically. Let's use some compression distraction techniques. Let's, let's do some of that. And then let's start to create a little bit of movement. So I guess it would be like static motor control, dynamic motor control, like local stability, and then isometrics in the grand scheme of things, starting to bridge across multiple joints and then teaching a little bit more eccentrics and controlling that full joint motion and then kind of working into concentric eccentric and rhythm and speed and velocity and yeah um as for when to accelerate uh i think it just comes back to your assessments and what you're seeing how the athlete's looking doing it um constantly reassessing day in day out um 
and progressing them. And if something didn't go well, you're backing them off a little bit. If something worked really well, you can maybe speed them up a little bit. So just observe and observe, try and keep, keep checking. Right on. Okay. Uh, so. Anecdotally, is there, and obviously we don't mention athletes' names on this show because that's not what this is about. Uh, no need to pry into private lives or anything. But if you could think of the athletes over the last few years that you've worked with as professional baseball players, was there a moment in time that was a huge light bulb event for you? And I, I think, I don't quote me on this. I think it was Sue Falzoni who was the first athletic trainer for, for Major League Baseball. She was with the LA Dodgers. And I think Sue was saying that there was one time where this guy had a recurring um, issue with their shoulder or hamstring. And lo and behold, it really came down to the fact that their opposite big toe was having issues. So it was the landing foot, the one that was coming off the mound and landing, and it wasn't landing properly. So it sent this whole chain reaction haywire through the body, resulting in some type of injury further up the chain. Was there a moment in time for you when that happened? Or are you just already there because it has become kind, I won't say commonplace, but more accepting of an understanding? I think in that aspect, it's definitely more accepting. Um, like, I think, I think we're at least open to the fact that a lot of the, like everyone kind of kinetic chain has become like a, a buzzword. So people are more open to that. And I think even just hearing about, I remember hearing about that incident um, or that story with the toe creating like a shoulder elbow injury. Um, so I don't think that so much. I think one light bulb moment that did happen for me was when I had a player that, that wasn't a very good mover, but he was a really good thrower. And it was a conversation with the coach of being like, Hey, what it's, it's this yin and yang of like, what really needs to be better and what's like good enough because he's elite. Right. And it's kind of coming down to that realization that there is no perfect but it's how can I kind of create the best athlete with what he has and what he's naturally gifted at and then what needs to move a little bit better just to make him a little bit more resilient so I think that was a big light ball moment for me um I had that with a couple different players where it wasn't it didn't need to be a project it was just like keep them resilient okay what about the opposite what about the time where you're working with somebody and then you just watch them move or watch them throw and you're going, oh, damn, I can't believe that that just I just took away their their advantage, their edge or or it's reduced them. OK, we're not going to do that movement anymore. W what we just did. Put that aside. Your body does not respond well to that. Instead, you know, do you ever have those moments where, you, because you're assessing and reassessing constantly, so there's got to come a time where you put something in the mix in that recipe and it doesn't have the desired outcome and you're going, oh, well, there's a learning moment, right? Has that yeah. happened? So I don't think there was a specific moment in that, but there was one in which uh, a player that I had worked with uh, was going to be throwing locally that day and uh it, there was a rain out and he was having some different issues where he like he wanted me to needle him and I'm like okay you're not you're not you're throwing so that's not a good idea today and he's he was convinced that he wasn't going to throw because the rain if you've ever been in South Florida in the late summer like the rain is just relentless he's like there's no way I'm throwing today like please do this and so um sure enough I needled him and he didn't have the best day I'm like well whoops but we were both in agreement that uh we collectively made that decision so um I think knowing your timing on things for sure was definitely a learning experience then um and the rewards and pros and cons of that but very cool so ultimately Danielle this is this is not your end game here just being with uh where you are because I, I get a sense that you're you're not satisfied with what you know you're always learning more you're always reaching out and performance wise too so do you do you have like is there an ultimate goal for you not to get you in trouble with the organization but do you want to be the lead physical therapist for major league sports and, and one of the uh and may, let's just say the twins yeah um I think the the biggest 
the only answer I can give is I don't know. So um, I think like, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying well, to figure that out. What about the Vikings? What about <laughs> switching sports and just being yeah. on the sidelines there? How would you feel about just bru brutal force over um, finesse and, and grace? Not to say that yeah. there isn't that in football, but I'm just trying to pick apart baseball and football no. together. No, I know. I uh, Something about it, like I love baseball. I love what goes into baseball. I love the, the complexity of some of the problems and the problem solving of figuring out like why did this kid have this going on and this kid has the same thing but they're two completely different athletes like I love the problem solving and kind of the repetition of it versus the acute care management of football for me is um not as appealing but I, I love watching football so don't get me wrong I actually thought about that last week um I'm just thinking like what I want to be in football and I, I don't think, I think I like just enjoying football. And for me, I just really enjoy working with baseball and uh, understanding, understanding that athlete. Yeah, so. I see, and, and I, love, I love both sports, but I see football as being kind of a conveyor system that, that just uh, chews them up and spits them out from one week to the next. And, and you've only got a few days to try and get these these players back together compared to baseball where you're on a journey with a hundred plus 140. How many games are in the, is 146? I can never remember. 162. It's 162. Yep. 162 games. And you've just got to, you've got to work in between games. You've got to work during game time and there, you don't have that whole week in between. So it's a different beast entirely. So I can see you just, you love getting up and getting right to it. Like you say, you, you want to have your feet just hit the ground running. So uh, who's, who are your, who are, you, who are the people that you look up to in this field? Are, are there, uh, are there, yeah. Uh, do you have yeah. heroes and heroines? Um, I think it depends on the part of the process, right? So um, I think Sue Falson in her own right has been amazing. I became aware of her think back in 2010 and then she was with the Dodgers it's like the first one of the first females in baseball amazing um and then just everyone that I learned from uh obviously anyone involved with FMS I've learned a great deal with deal from um anyone involved in the sports residency back in Evansville I learned a great deal from I've had clinical instructors along the way back when I was a PT student uh coaches along the way um, even going about, back to high school, high school coaches, like, sure. Yeah. Who, you know, you mentioned sports chiropractic. Is that something that you want to get mm -hmm. involved in? You want to get back to school, go to Davenport, Iowa, or, or actually there's, there's a Palmer in Florida now. So yeah, are you looking into that? No, probably not. I don't think I want to do okay. more school unless it's like maybe a PhD or something eventually. And I can't believe I just said that, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think like, I can learn from all those people. I don't have to have the credentials, right? So if, if, I, can, if I can learn something from you, like I, I don't care what letters are behind the name. Beautiful. So. Oh. oh, Danielle, this has been fantastic. I really enjoy uh, the conversation and uh, excited for you and for the Twins organization leading up into spring training because you've only got a few months to go, right? What, so what is yep. it that you're doing now to prepare for the upcoming season. I mean, obviously yeah. players play baseball all year round, but when it comes time for <clears throat> minor leagues, which, well, the the minor leagues, what, what's that, 86 games in a season? It's fewer. Great question. It's, all right. it depends because there, it depends on what, what level as well. All right, but you're gonna be only a few months away. What are you doing to prepare for 2023? Yeah. It's kind of learning, working on different projects trying to make kind of our team run a little bit better. Um, just improving processes. Uh, usually we would have rehab athletes still going throughout the year, but we typically shut down around this December time. So this would still be downtime for me. Um, but we get back up and running right away in mid January with camps and rehab athletes coming back to the facility. So right there's not a lot of downtime. No, I don't imagine. Well, at least you'll have the downtime in Florida and not up in the great white North. So if, yes. if people want to find out more, uh, where can they go? Do you have an Instagram page? Do you yeah. LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever? Um, I'm present on social media. I'm not always very active. 
mm-hmm. but I have Instagram. Uh, I have a personal account and then I have another account that I have not been active on, uh, DR Honet. And then uh, Facebook, I'm not really on uh, Twitter. I'm present. And then LinkedIn is probably the most active. So. All right. And I'll put some links down in the description below the podcast. So if you want to reach out to Danielle, then you'll know how to do so. But this has been great. I really want to thank you for coming on and, and chatting with me. Yeah, and thank I you. wish you the best Pleasure's luck. Pleasure's been online. Thank you. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Zealous Podcast. I want to thank Danielle as well as the Twins organization for coming on and sharing some insight and information. I look forward to seeing what the 2023 season is going to bring for the Twins. And meanwhile, don't forget, go to RockySnyder.com, my website, click on events, drop down to workshops and courses, and register for the one-day Perform Better seminar I'm going to be doing on closed chain biomechanics, anatomy in motion. You can register there, and there's a 40% discount if you register right now. As well as the next two days after that in Hingham, Massachusetts, not far away from West Warwick, Rhode Island, we'll have an upper body course on closed chain biomechanics as it relates to the gait cycle. This is game changing information, at least it has been for me and a whole bunch of others. And in the meantime, do hit that subscribe button, follow us on Instagram, Rocky underscore Snyder, and we'll see you next week.